In Africa's waterways, the Nile crocodile reigns supreme. It's one of the biggest and most feared reptiles on Earth. Snatching victims from banks and boats, crocodiles terrorize villagers that share the river with them. With up to two fatal attacks recorded each day, this hugely successful and cunning predator has been reclassified as the number one killer of humans in Africa, overtaking the previous title holder, the hippo. Wildlife cameraman Brad Besterlink is planning the unthinkable. He intends to dive into the crocodile-infested waters of the Okavango Delta. Without a cage or any other protection, his mission is to study these unpredictable creatures in their natural underwater domain. A feat never attempted before. And one which is fraught with danger. Botswana's Okavango Delta is fed by a river that flows into a shallow valley called the Panhandle. This waterway meanders from Botswana's northern border and eventually spills into the delta 120 kilometers downstream. During the winter months between May and August, the Panhandle floods, creating vast wetlands of papyrus and grass. For Brad Besterlink, the flooded river is like his backyard. I've always been an Okavango child. I've played on every island. I've swum in every lagoon. I've explored every channel. This area has been my playground for my entire life. Brad returns every winter to film the Panhandle's huge variety of wildlife. He finds plenty of subjects. A menagerie of animals come to this lush water world for shelter, food, and to breed. Hippos, the largest residents, forge new waterways through the endless fields of reeds. The lechway is an antelope with splayed hooves that have evolved for life on water. Birds feast on the abundant insects and fish that inhabit the river, its tributaries and hidden lagoons. Over 70 species of fish are found in the panhandle. The smallest and youngest live in the lily lagoons hiding from the predators that prefer the open water of the bigger channels. Tigerfish are the African equivalent of the South American piranha, bearing razor-sharp teeth and bad attitudes. But they're not the top of the food chain. The abundance of fish sounds the dinner bell for a formidable predator. More crocodiles live in the Panhandle than in the entire Okavango Delta. And in winter, even more arrive to breed, their numbers peaking at over 3,000. But the plentiful fish that attract crocodiles also attract humans. As more people settle on the banks of the river, Man and beast compete for space and resources. They share an uneasy coexistence that's not always peaceful. Attacks are on the increase throughout the Delta region. Fishermen get pulled from their Makoros, the traditional fishing canoe. But most victims are women and children who come to the water's edge to wash. When Retseng was a young girl, she was collecting lily bulbs with her mother, Mohure, on an island in the river. 
Suddenly, Mahure noticed something odd. That was her only warning. Mahure pulled her daughter to safety, but not before the crocodile inflicted terrible injuries. They were both lucky to survive the attack. Mahure still makes a living harvesting lilies and her daughter performs in a traditional dancing group. But not all victims are as lucky. About 750 people die from crocodile attacks in Africa each year, 15 of them in Botswana. Although Brad knows the dangers lurking in the Panhandle's waters, he often comes here with his family. His children, the fifth generation of Besterlinx born in Botswana, share his passion and fascination with the area. His wife, Andy, has her own sense of adventure. Brad and I both have that curious streak in us where we do want to explore what's out there, to find out more about where we are, about our environment. But a mother's instinct is to be protective. I think initially, for me, the fear of having them in this environment was greater than the reality. When you get here, you realize that it's, it's a brilliant world for them to grow up in. And they adjusted immediately. They are quite fearless. Brad knows his way around the panhandle better than most. He's filmed the resident wildlife here for over a decade. But it's the Nile crocodile that has always held a special fascination for him. In particular, it's unseen underwater activities. Recently, he's been filming crocodile hunting behavior at a heronry, a breeding colony of darters and cormorants. The reptiles silently move into position under the water, waiting for the young, inexperienced birds to fall. They lie with only their eyes, ears, and nostrils above the surface. Submerged like this, they hide their true size. On the bank, Brad waits patiently to film the action. The fledglings drop into the water and can't take off. So they swim back to the base of the tree and try to climb. But darters are designed to swim. Webbed feet are not meant for climbing, and neither are their long necks. Many don't make it back to the nest, falling helplessly into the water. They are literally sitting ducks. After having their fill, the crocodiles disappear into the depths and out of sight. No one knows how they actually behave under the water. After seeing the darters and cormorants actually bailing off and going un under the water, I really felt that it's imperative that I actually go underwater and see what is going on. It was just such a big part of that environment and that circumstance of behavior that was missing. To capture it, he'll have to dive under the heronry. No one has ever tried this before.
But he won't just be diving with them. He'll be swimming into their hunting zone, where the reptiles are alert and hungry. First, he better do his homework. To find out what to expect when he comes face to face with a crocodile, he seeks the advice of scientist Vince Shax. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay. yeah it's dead. Vince heads up the Okavango Crocodile Monitoring Project for Botswana National Parks. The project maps out conservation areas for the big reptiles. For the past five years, Vince and his colleagues have been catching, marking, and measuring crocodiles. In this way, they can determine their numbers and health. Okay, small, can you just turn all the lights off? The best time to catch crocodiles is at night. They are easily spotted by the glow of the iridescent cells in their eyes. The reflective layer amplifies the light entering the eyes to help the crocodile spot prey in the dark. Vince catches juveniles with one hand, but he needs to watch their tiny teeth, which could shred his fingers. Larger crocodiles, anything longer than a meter, are more difficult to catch. All lights on the boat except the searchlight are switched off to hide Brad and Vince. This makes for a stealthier approach in the dead of night. they approach a much bigger crocodile. They move quickly to minimize the animal's stress. They need to disarm its gaping jaws. It's still safe, eh? Yeah, yeah, it's cool. If I can get him to latch it, I can... Then they have to haul it aboard. Vince calms the angry crocodile by blindfolding it. You ready? It seems to work. Ready? Yeah. One, two, three. Over. 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 Tail. 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 Turn it out. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now sit there. Sit there. Sit there. They need to turn the beast on its back to determine its sex. All right. So. You want to start? Okay. Yeah. You can find it, but you, you must just stay sitting on him, man. Eh? Okay, it's a female. While Vince gathers his research data, Brad and crew make sure it doesn't move. Within 15 minutes, Vince has taken all the data he needs. So Brad, this is the, the typical size adult that you'll have moving around up and down the, the main channel this time of the year. No. Through this monitoring project, Vince and his colleagues have caught and identified 2,500 crocodiles. This time of year is the best time to do this. Huge numbers of crocodiles come to the panhandle to mate. It's also the best time for Brad to dive, while the water is at its clearest. With the clean water in winter and it being very, very cold, I mean, how long do you think we've got? You'd have to do it as soon as possible. I mean, you want to 
get it before the water dirties and obviously before the temperatures start going up. Well, I mean, you knowing these things, what, what could you expect? I mean, what do you think? How do you think they're going to react? On the well, it's, it's, yeah, it's difficult to say. I mean, no one's, no one's been down, no one's spent enough time down there to say how they're going to react. My, my instinct says that they, they'll react to anything that comes close to them underwater. But it is winter, it's cold, um, they're not as active. If, so, if, if there is a good time to dive, no. which I don't think there is, but this is probably the best season to do it. <laughs> Yeah, but um, yeah, you've got to be crazy to be going down here at any time of the year, in my opinion. One, two, three. Good one. <laughs> The window of opportunity to dive opens for two months during winter. When the headwaters that gather further north reach the panhandle and flooded. The fast flowing water washes away the sediment and suspended particles, allowing up to 15 meters of visibility underwater. After winter, the water level drops again. But there's another reason to dive with crocodiles at this time. Because the temperatures are so low this time of the year, their metabolism slows down quite a bit and um, they don't eat as much. So all activity kind of shuts down during the winter period. Brad also believes that he may be safer because the crocodiles of the Okavango aren't used to preying on large animals. The swampy papyrus banks of the area do not allow wildebeest or zebra to approach the water to drink, so the reptiles here rely on catching birds and fish. In other parts of Africa, where the terrain is different, the Nile crocodile is a regular killer of large mammals. Using their extraordinary power to devastating effect. Growing over six meters long, and with almost a ton and a half of bone-crushing bite force, these prehistoric killers put the great white shark to shame. Once they lock onto their prey, there's no getting away. This is the reality Brad must face when he goes into the water. Because they're not familiar with divers, he hopes they'll act defensively rather than aggressively. Andy, Brad's wife, and a diving instructor in her own right, will accompany him and watch his back. Nothing will have prepared her for this hazardous dive. Vince comes too. He'll stay on board to monitor this first dive at the heronry. The strategy is to jump in upstream and drift down to avoid disturbing the birds. The strong current sweeps them along past huge submerged trees. They come across a sunken fishing canoe, a Makoro, which appears to have been badly damaged. Fishermen go missing in the Okavango every year and crocodiles are the prime suspects. They rarely leave any trace of their victims. 
As they approach the heronry, Brad and Andy make their first contact. They follow as it glides over logs and debris. Surprisingly, they're able to get quite close. Underwater, the crocodile is graceful. It swims with its powerful tail and it tucks its limbs against its body for streamlining. When it comes to rest, it uses its webbed feet as brakes. By crocodile standards, this two-meter specimen is relatively small. But that doesn't mean it's relatively harmless. Crocodiles are notoriously unpredictable at any size. Andy and Brad have dived with other big predators before, such as sharks and know it's crucial not to invade their space or show any signs of panic. They are careful to avoid any sudden movements. This one backs away, and then it flees, disappearing in a cloud of sand. As they approach the heronry, Andy hangs onto a branch to keep watch. Brad swims into the narrow channel beneath the tree and into the hunting ground. Lying in front of Brad is a crocodile. Its eyes are out of the water, looking up, poised for the kill. Brad edges closer. Too close. The crocodile senses him, but instead of attacking, it moves away. It's too fast for Brad to follow. With air running low, the divers need to surface. As they approach the boat, they know they're at the most vulnerable. The surface is a prime killing zone for crocodiles. On the surface, the inherent fear of crocodiles is still there. You feel like you're a rapala floating on the surface of the water, waiting to be eaten by something. Brad goes up first, while Andy keeps to the relative safety of the bottom. Then, with Brad and Vince looking overboard, Andy scrambles into the boat. How was that? 
unreal. Incredible. Wow, that was amazing. Too. I didn't I didn't think that we could actually get that close to the radio. Really, oh no. really amazing. A sense of adventure drives them now. They want more footage, but need to spend more time in the water. Seeing a crocodile for the first time underwater was an exciting turning point for us. It was a surprise, and you get the sudden jolt of adrenaline and just fascination. The next day, they set out again, determined to film as much underwater behavior as possible. But the waters won't be clear for much longer. The couple must make the most of it. They patrol the channels of the panhandle, looking for a good diving spot. They come across a crocodile on the riverbank, basking in the sun to warm its body. But as soon as it hears the approaching boat, it dives into the safety of the water. Brad and Andy decide to follow it. They drift with the current, searching the channel. They eventually find the crocodile lying motionless on the bottom. These animals need air, but they can stay underwater for hours by slowing their heart rate. But that doesn't mean they're sluggish. They can lunge forward with frightening speed. Brad approaches cautiously. If the crocodile feels cornered, it could lash out. It's three and a half meters of muscle with a jaw that could rip Brad's arm off. He inches closer, but how well can the crocodile see him? They have that nictitating membrane which covers the eye, and that inhibits the eye from changing focus while under the water. Like sharks, crocodiles have a sixth sense. Around their snout, sensory pits detect movement, which helps them hunt fish at night. The reptile can probably feel Brad's presence. Realizing that he's much bigger than a normal fish, it retreats. The crocodile leaves the bright center of the channel and moves to the darker edge against the papyrus bank. Then it disappears. Brad surprised. He thought the bank was solid. But on closer inspection, he realizes that the crocodile has entered what appears to be a cave. Brad's lights reveal strange fish hiding upside down in the papyrus roots. A 
A large catfish swims along the cave floor. But going deeper into this cave unprepared would be foolhardy. It's a dangerous void where the crocodiles have every advantage and divers are intruders. They quickly exit the cave and ascend into the dangerous mid-water. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a crocodile charges into Brad. A timely reminder just how dangerous these waters can be. Badly shaken, it's clearly time to get back onto the boat as quickly as possible. Was this a warning? A crocodile defending its territory? Or perhaps it simply couldn't see the two divers in its path? Back at camp, Brad and Andy show Vince the footage from the dive. He never expected such close interactions between diver and crocodile. Bright, eh? Now it's clean, eh? It's very, very clean. And this is on the edge of the main channel next to the, next to the heronry, and it's quite incredible. It's a nice-sized croc as well, eh? That's actually an amazing opportunity to get photo records. Once you have that photo, we can already say this is individual A. Go back next year, we say, hold on, that's individual mm. A again, look at the markings. If we can get more information on these adults, it would, it would be very helpful to the data. Now, what I want to know is, <laughs> is that, is that, does that cave continue? Or are we talking about a closed off area? What? There's one thing what that I'm Vince cannot answer. Is maybe they're using the, 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 the reason the, for the crocodiles the, disappearing the, under the papyrus the, and into the cave. This is individual A. I knew that there was definitely a, a layer of some sort that the crocodiles could access. The structure of that layer I wasn't sure about. Brad is determined to explore further, but he'd better hurry. The window of opportunity to dive is closing, and if he misses this chance, he won't get another until next year. In the panhandle, papyrus grows everywhere. It's an extremely buoyant plant with hollow fibrous stems and tissue saturated with oil. This makes the papyrus float, creating dark spaces beneath that many creatures use. As winter ends and the panhandle floodwaters slow, the water level will drop, closing the gap between the floating vegetation and the muddy bottom. By the end of August, the roots will brush the riverbed. Then the secret caves of the crocodiles will close for the rest of the year. To prepare himself for the pitch black conditions he'll encounter in the cave, Brad decides to take a night dive in the main channel. At least he'll get some idea of what to expect, hopefully without crocodiles. The dive is disconcerting because they can't see a thing beyond their lights. For me, the night dive in the delta was, it was scarier than the night dive in the sea, specifically because of the crocodiles. During the day, you feel you're more in control. You can see more, whereas at night, you've got one tiny beam of light and you don't want to bump into a crocodile. After the incident of the previous day, they know they're extremely vulnerable to attack. But it's only a taste of what they'll face in the crocodile cave.
Though aware of the danger, Brad is fascinated by his first glimpse under the waters of the Okavango at night, a place he knows so well by day. The underwater world in the Delta, is, it's got to be one of the most beautiful places in the world. It's just incredible. Several species of squeaker come out from hiding to feed on algae. These catfish prefer the slow flowing backwaters of the panhandle. The day shift hunters hide in the vegetation. By the end of the dive, Brad has a much better idea of the challenges he'll face in the dark caves. Good stuff. Yeah. I'm quite relieved not seeing crocodiles under there. Though. I mean, it's uh, yeah. you've got such a limited view, it's being so dark and just with the lights on. It's a bit of a relief. It's pretty. It's so scary just not being able to see beyond that point. Yeah. point anything. Of the yeah. Anything could be out there. The following morning brings a setback. Winter rain is unusual in Botswana. It's not unwelcome, but it affects the visibility around the camp. For the divers, the runoff causes havoc with the clear water. Sediment and weed are flushed into the channels. Swimming into the caves under these conditions would be extremely dangerous. We're really just so keen to get in the water and do this now, and we have to sit and wait for this unseasonal weather. So it's, it's very frustrating. But the fickle conditions change again, and the closing window for diving creaks open a little. The sky clears, and the visibility improves. The crisp winter air of the panhandle matches the 15 degree water. Brad and Andy finally set out for the papyrus cave. This is their last chance to dive under the papyrus. The dropping water level leaves its mark on the reeds. They enter the water and sink quickly to the bottom. They drift with the current, looking for the cave entrance. Sixty minutes of air is all they have. It should be enough to explore the cave. Almost immediately, they spot a huge crocodile. A four and a half meter monster. The size suggests it's a male. It's the biggest crocodile that Brad and Andy have ever encountered underwater. They have no idea how it'll behave. The monster sluggishly moves away. Brad and Andy follow at a safe distance. comes to rest in the darkness of a deep overhang. It dwarfs Brad.
With its head wedged under the papyrus, the crocodile seems cornered. It's a potentially dangerous situation. This crocodile can move much faster than a diver. He wouldn't stand a chance against it, but he keeps the camera rolling. Then, the beast lumbers towards the darkness. The crocodile disappears into the same cave they'd found the previous day. Brad and Andy follow it into the unknown. It's a bizarre world, an almost hostile environment, and I was worried about going in. Every now and then there's a break in the papyrus from the surface and you get shafts of light which illuminate just a section. The only way to track the crocodile is to follow the cloud of sediment it kicks up. Behind him, Andy has to swim through Brad's sediment trail as well as the crocodile's. It's probably the most terrifying moment of her diving career. She's completely blinded and struggles to keep up. The crocodile takes them deeper and deeper into the cave. 30 meters and 20 minutes into their hour-long dive. It pauses in the spotlight. Brad holds his ground, keeping the camera focused on the crocodile. Who'll make the first move? The first thing you start seeing is the white from the teeth in this black, black, black environment. It really is beautiful. The crocodile moves. In this claustrophobic space, it holds all the aces. It pauses again. It seems to be weighing up its options. Fight or flight. It carries on deeper into the labyrinth. But another fear grips the divers. They've been so focused on following the crocodile they haven't paid attention to where they're going. They did not enter the cave with a guide rope. Pulling a rope would be cumbersome because you're often in very, very narrow areas and there's a lot of big pieces of vegetation and it just sort of slows you down. They have 15 minutes of air left and they're right behind the giant predator. If they turn away now, it could attack. But the crocodile moves deeper into the abyss. We get completely disorientated in those caves. At the time, when you're following a crocodile, you don't really think about it. There's no way to know where you are or where out is. With only 10 minutes of air left in their tanks, the couple will still need time to find their way out.
Brad takes a moment to scan the large chamber, trying to get his bearings. His lights reveal another form in the cave, a second animal. Slightly smaller than the one they followed, perhaps it's a female. Maybe reptiles congregate in these caves for the mating season. But it's just a glimpse. Darkness engulfs the crocodiles, taking their secret deeper into the cave. Six minutes of air left. 40 meters back to the exit, but which way? This is not the time to panic. They shine their lights around them, the beams barely penetrating the murky darkness. They have no idea which direction to take. I had no clue how far we'd come under the papyrus, how far we'd swum. You do lose sense of distance and time, but Brad did seem to know a direction. Brad follows the slight current, hoping that it flows towards the opening. But what if another crocodile has come into the cave behind them? After what seems an eternity, they finally see the light at the exit. They swim out with their last few breaths of air. This has been an extraordinary dive. Hidden from the bright world above, they have been able to see how the crocodiles navigate efficiently through the maze beneath the floating papyrus. But when winter ends, the crocodiles and their caves will be gone. For Brad, Andy and Vince, this experience marks the beginning of an exciting new journey. After a lifetime of exploring the channels of the Okavango, Brad has found a whole new world. He has dared to enter the dangerous realm of the Nile crocodile and come back with images no one has ever seen before, a tantalizing glimpse of unique behavior. may be using the caves as mating territories. Or the crocodiles might come here to feed, moving unnoticed to basking areas on the banks. Looking at Brad's footage, he's basically taken our eyes underneath the papyrus. The crocodile's mission isn't clear, but Brad and Andy's is. They'll return to the caves next winter to find out more. Spending time underwater with crocodiles has raised so many questions. Why are these crocodiles there? Do they know these caves very well? And what they're using them for? How they're navigating in the caves? I think diving with crocodiles and filming them underwater in Okavango has really just opened up a, a gateway to learn so much more about the behavior. I see it more as the stepping stones to a whole new environment. There's so much more to learn, so much more to explore. In this well-studied world of ours, it's good to know that nature still holds some mystery. And for Brad and Andy, this riddle is unfolding right in their own backyard, in the secret caves of the crocodiles. <laughs>